Hi y'all, I'm Donica and in today's video we're going to talk about the new releases for January 2023. I have been doing these videos for the last couple months so I will link a playlist down below if you want to catch up on new releases that I was interested in. January is definitely making up for November and December. Y'all say a prayer for my wallet. Ain't nothing wrong with it. It's just empty and I have all these books to buy. <laughs> Shout out to my mom and dad. They did gift me a Barnes & Noble gift card. I think it goes without saying these are the ones that I'm most interested in. I cannot hit all new releases or I would be here for three hours talking my own ear off. We're gonna start with books releasing January 3rd. The first one is called The Thing in the Snow by Sean Adams. It describes itself as equal parts satire and psychological thriller. So there is a little bit of dry humor, quirky humor. I am a big fan of authors that use that type of humor. At the far reaches of the world, the Northern Institute sits in a vast expanse of ice and snow. Once a thriving research facility, its operations were abruptly shut down after an unspecified incident in which all research teams promptly evacuated. So after everyone is evacuated, it's now home to only a team of three caretakers, Gibbs, Klein, and their supervisor Hart, and a single remaining researcher named Gilroy, who is feverishly studying the sensation of coldness. So these four remaining workers were not told why everyone was evacuated but them. Talk about dedication, right? Now that everyone is gone, their objective is simple. Occupy the space, complete their weekly tasks, and keep the building in working order in case research ever resumes. The one rule though that they must follow is never ever go outside. As they are in this very chilly climate, it's not that big of a rule. They don't want to go out there anyway, except a mysterious object has appeared out in the snow. Gibbs and Klein are mesmerized. They can't discern its exact shape and color, nor if it's moving or in a fixed place, but it is there isn't it? Hence the psychological aspect. They're all cooped up in this building. They're told don't go outside ever. Trust us. Oh, by the way, we're all getting evacuated. We're not telling you why, but don't go outside. They do the same things in and out, especially the caretakers. And then you see this object and you're already going stir crazy. So do you break that one rule? Do you go out there? And is there even anything out there? <laughs> well, Hart, the one sole researcher remaining, thinks that thing in the snow is an unwelcome distraction and probably a huge waste of time. Though, come to think of it, time itself has been a bit wonky lately. Weekends pass in a blur and he can hardly tell day from night. Gravity seems less than reliable and he feels an odd thrumming sensation in his beard. From what I can tell, take that summary at its face value. I think this is one of those things where maybe there's not going to be this awesome explanation at the end, but you enjoy sitting there with four people who might be slowly losing it. I have mentioned before how much I loved Leave the World Behind. I have mentioned how much I love this book, and I know this was not everyone's cup of tea because there is some sort of apocalyptic event or occurrence going on out in the world. We don't see any of it. We are just in one location, like an Airbnb, with a family, and then the owners of the Airbnb come. It's almost like a slice of life. What would happen if there's something really horrific going on, you know, and you're in this secluded location. I loved that. I know a lot of people were like, because you're kind of left hanging in that book. What's going on? That's not the story. The story isn't what's going on. It's what's going on in this one location with these people. So it kind of gave me those vibes. So that's what really interested me. The next book is called The Black House by Carol Johnstone. This was released August 4th in the UK. January 3rd is going to be its US and Canada debut. I'm a sucker for isolated locations in Scotland, which this one is, and it's also a reincarnation whodunit. A remote village, a deadly secret, an outsider who knows the truth. For her entire life, Maggie McKay has sensed something wrong with her. When Maggie was five years old, she announced that a man on Kilmaray, a place she'd never visited, had been murdered. How did she know this? Well, because she claims that she is a reincarnation of 
the murdered man. Nearly 20 years later, in one psychiatric hospital stint, Maggie is determined to find out what really happened and what the islanders are hiding. Unfortunately, this little village where this murder occurred, they're not gonna open Maggie with welcoming arms. They're gonna close ranks quickly. Maggie is gonna have to try really hard as the outsider to try to seek justice. So with the villagers closing ranks, Maggie is forced to consider how much she is willing to risk to discover the horrifying truth. The question becomes, can justice prevail when a whole entire community is willing to do anything to keep the secret under wraps? This is told in multiple perspectives and timelines. 90% of the books I read now are told in multiple timelines and perspectives, so I definitely come to expect that. And I really enjoy that. I really like seeing how the two timelines and all the people, how it all comes together. I don't know if y'all remember that movie Crash. It came out early 2000s, late 90s. I watched that so many times when I was younger. It just absolutely floored me how it's following all of these perspectives that eventually kind of link together. So I do enjoy books that do that really well. So now we're moving on to January 10th where a majority of these books are dropping. The first one I'm going to talk about is called Bad Cree by Jessica Johns. Jessica Johns is actually a Cree auntie and member of Sucker Creek First Nation in Treaty 8 territory in northern Alberta. It actually started as a short story. So in 2020, Bad Cree won two awards. So now sitting at 272 pages, it seems like it's an expanded version of that short story. This is a gripping debut tinged with supernatural horror. A young Cree woman's dreams lead her on a perilous journey of self-discovery that ultimately forces her to confront the toll of a legacy of violence on her family. When Mackenzie wakes up with a severed crow's head in her hand, she panics. Only moments earlier, she had been fending off masses of birds in a snow-covered forest. In bed, when she blinks, the head disappears. Night after night, her dreams return her to a memory from before her sister Sabrina's untimely death. A weekend at the family lakefront campsite, long obscured by a fog of guilt. So these dreams are really affecting Mackenzie, but there are also disturbing things happening to her while she's awake. A murder of crows stalks her every move around the city, which murder of crows, that has got to be the most iconic name for a group of something. It's like when all your friends get together and y'all are called a murder, it's like, stay away from me. You know, that's the vibe I'm trying to give. We are a murder of crows, leave us alone. So the murder of crows are stalking her. She wakes up from a dream of drowning, throwing up water, and she starts getting threatening text messages from someone claiming to be her deceased sister. With all of this combined, Mackenzie knows this is more than she can handle alone. So she travels north to her hometown in Alberta. She finds her family still steeped in the same grief that she ran away to Vancouver to escape. They welcome her back, but their shaky reunion only seems to intensify her dreams and make them more dangerous. What really happened at the lake and what did it have to do with Sabrina's death? Only a bad creek would put their family at risk. But what if whatever has been calling Mackenzie home was already inside? Oh, that's so powerful. Only a bad Cree would put their family at risk. It's so sad because you have this expectation to be this perfect person or represent your family in this way. And yet she's scared. She needs help. So she's bringing the danger potentially to her family, but she's scared and alone, doesn't know what to do. So that I can definitely relate to of that. You don't want to drag your family down. But at the same time, what if you need help? Some of that negative self-talk still calling you a bad daughter, or in this case, like a bad Cree. It still might be hard to escape those feelings, but if you need help, you need help. An underrepresented group of people, own voices tell some of the Cree language in here, their culture, family drama, if any of that sounds good to you, this looks like one to really be on the lookout for. The next one might be a guilty pleasure of mine. I mean, it could be a absolutely amazing book written incredibly well, but for right now, I'm just gonna say it's my guilty pleasure. It's called The Nightmare Man by J.H. Markert. Scarecrows are my clowns. No me gusta scarecrows, but look at this cover. Look at, look at this cover. It looks like it's been ripped. I feel like I have to buy it. Blackwood Mansion looms, surrounded by nightmare pines atop the hill over the small town of New Haven. Ben Bookman, best-selling novelist and heir to the Blackwood estate, spent a weekend at the ancestral home to finish writing his latest horror novel, The Scarecrow. Now on the eve of the book's release, the terrible story within begins to unfold 
cold in real life. Detective Mills arrives at the scene of a gruesome murder, a family butchered and bundled inside cocoons stitched from corn husks and hung from the rafters of a barn, eerily mirroring the opening of Bookman's latest novel. When another family is killed in a similar manner, Mills, along with his daughter, rookie detective Samantha Blue, is determined to find the link to the book and the killer before the story reaches its chilling climax. A series of scarecrow crimes continue to mirror the book. Ben quickly becomes the prime suspect. He can't remember much from the night he finished writing the novel, but he knows he wrote it in the atrium, his grandfather's forbidden room full of numbered books. Thousands of books, books without words. So weird. I'm hoping this gives me what I've been looking for in a type of slasher book. I'm gonna put a little screenshot here. This is what kind of scared me a little bit because I went to the author's page to look up, you know, their bio, what else they may have written, and a quote from The Nightmare Man. It was just one quote and it said, Scarecrows scare. That's what they do. Not super promising for a quote to have just like one quote to pick from the book. Um, so I'm gonna read that with minimal expectations, but knowing how much scarecrows do scare me, that's what they do. <laughs> I might have a good time. Okay, so the next book is called All the Dangerous Things by Stacey Willingham. I actually already have it. If you're part of book of the month, we were able to get that early. I was looking forward to this book because I really enjoyed her debut novel. I think a lot of people really enjoyed it. It was a soft Solid thriller. It definitely hit all my checkboxes for a good thriller. This is being published by Minotaur Books. I love Minotaur Books. I love that publishing company. So many books I love, so many authors I love come from that publishing company. They're like the Lionsgate films to me. If I see Minotaur Books, I know I'm about to have a good time. One year ago, Isabel Drake's life changed forever. Her toddler son, Mason, was taken out of his crib in the middle of the night while she and her husband were asleep in the next room. With little evidence and few leads for the police to chase, the case quickly went cold. However, Isabel cannot rest until Mason is returned to her literally. Except for the occasional catnap or small blackout where she loses track of time, she hasn't slept in a year. If one of my kids went missing, I, I understand. You'd have to sedate me. You'd have to sedate me because there's no functioning at that point. So she is past sleep deprived. She's not sleeping. How much of what she's seeing or hearing or thinking can we believe? And then she's having these blackouts where she does stuff that we don't even know what she's doing. Isabel's entire existence now revolves around finding him, but she knows she can't can't go on this way forever. In hopes of jarring loose a new witness or buried clue, she agrees to be interviewed by a true crime podcaster. But his interest in Isabel's past makes her nervous. His incessant questioning paired with her severe insomnia has brought up uncomfortable memories from her own childhood, making Isabel start to doubt her recollection of the night of Mason's disappearance, as well as second guess who she can trust, including herself. My hopes are very high for that one. I feel like that's going to be a solid read. The the next one is called City Under One Roof by Iris Yamashita. This is her debut novel but she actually wrote the screenplay for the highly acclaimed movie Letters from Iwo Jima. This is a mystery thriller with a really interesting premise because a murder takes place in a tiny Alaskan town where everyone lives in a single high-rise building and to actually get to the town you have to go through this little tunnel so it's this very secluded town where everyone lives in the same building. What could go wrong? When a local teenager discovers a severed hand and foot washed up on the shore of a small town in Alaska Kara Kennedy is on the case. A detective from Anchorage, she has her own motives for investigating the possible murder. After a blizzard causes a tunnel to close indefinitely, Kara is stuck among the among the odd and suspicious residents of the town, all 205 of whom live in the same high-rise building and are as icy as the weather. Kara teams up with the police officer Joe Barkowski, but before long, the investigation is upended by fearsome gang members from a nearby native village. Haunted by her past, Kara soon discovers that everyone in this town has something to hide. Will she be able to unravel their secrets before she unravels? A murder mystery in a very secluded place. There's 205 suspects at least. Look at the cover on this one. The Things We Do to Our Friends by Heather Darwin, and this is her debut novel. This is set in Edinburgh, Scotland. Our main character Claire arrives utterly alone and yearning to reinvent herself. And what better place to conceal the dark secrets in her past than at the university in the heart of the fabled cobblestone old town. When Claire meets Tabitha, a charismatic, beautiful, and rich girl from her art history class, she knows she's destined to be friends with her and her exclusive 
creative circle. Claire is immediately drawn into their world of sophisticated dinner parties and summers in France. The new life she always envisioned for herself has seemingly begun. And then Tabitha reveals a little project she's been working on, one that she needs Claire's help with, even though it goes against everything Claire has tried to repent for, even though their intimacy begins to darken into codependence. But as Claire starts to realize just what her friends are capable of, it's already too late. They're so close to attaining the things they want and there's no going back. What is the cost of an extraordinary life if others have to pay? Definitely lots of toxic relationships, codependent relationships. Who knows what Claire is running from, but Tabitha is definitely not the answer. Not everything that glares is gold. Claire is getting enticed by all that money and those exclusive parties, these fun trips that I'm sure she's not used to. And that's how they hook you. That is how they hook you. Next book is called Just the Nicest Couple by Mary Kubica. Local Woman Missing was one of my favorite books from 2021. I actually thought I read it this year. That's how much I still think about that book. I don't know why. I think it was just one of those thrillers that just plot was good, pacing was good, characters were good, mystery was good. I think I just loved every single aspect about it. <laughs> two couples, two close friends, one missing husband. Jake Hayes is missing, this much is certain. At first, his wife Nina thinks he's blowing off steam at a friend's house after their heated fight the night before. But then a day goes on, two days, five, and Jake is still nowhere to be found. Lily Scott, Nina's friend and co-worker, thinks she may have been the last to see Jake before he went missing. After Lily confesses everything to her husband Christian, the two decide that nobody can find out what happened leading up to Jake's disappearance, especially not Nina. But Nina is out there looking for her husband and she won't stop until the truth is discovered. Unfortunately, I did see some reviews from ARC readers and they were talking about how the writing just, it didn't fit Mary very cute because normal style, the sentences were very abrupt. So I'm really hopeful that that doesn't hinder my reading or maybe that's something I don't notice too much because this is one of my most anticipated reads for 2023. So I'll let y'all know when I read that one, I think. Back to back, we're gonna have another one of my most anticipated reads for 2023. And that is How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. I've been anticipating this book for like four months because I thought it was coming out I think last October. It didn't. He's gonna be at a bookstore that's kind of far from me but kind of close to me because everything is so far away in Texas anyway. I don't know if I want to drive that far but I've never met an author. I've never been to a book sighting. So if I was going to go for anyone, Grady Hendrix would be one of them. I do enjoy his books. A hilarious and terrifying new novel from the New York Times bestselling author of the Final Girls Support Group. Every childhood home is haunted and each of us are possessed by our parents. When their parents die at the tail end of the coronavirus pandemic, Louise and Mark Joyner are devastated, but nothing can prepare them for how bad things are about to get. The two siblings are almost totally estranged and couldn't be more different. Now, however, they don't have a choice but to get along. The virus has passed and both of them are facing bank accounts ravaged by the economic meltdown. Their one asset, their childhood home. They need to get on the market as soon as possible because they need the money. Yet before her parents died, they taped newspaper over the mirrors and nailed shut the attic door. <laughs> As disturbing events stack up in the house, Louise and Mark have to learn that sometimes the only way to break away from the past, sometimes the only way to sell a haunted house is to burn it all down. I think his books are really fun horror. They're not outright funny, but there is some dry humor. I'm interested to see his take on toxic parents and how that affects the children. With the brother and sister being estranged, I'm hopeful that this will bring them back together. I had it pre-ordered, but like I said, I might go to that book signing. So I'll just buy it there and, and get it signed and look into Grady Hendrix's eye and just say, hi. Thank you for writing this. He seems like a really quirky fellow and even his book signing looks like it's an event. It says he's gonna be like dan tap dancing and I don't even know what. Did I say that one released January 14th? These next two released January 17th. The first one is What Lies in the Wood by Kate Alice Marshall. This is a mystery thriller. Naomi Shaw used to believe in magic. 22 years ago, she and her two best friends, Cassie and Olivia, spent the summer roaming the woods, imagining a world of ceremony and wonder. They called it the God this game. The summer ended suddenly when Naomi was attacked. Miraculously, she survived her 17 stab wounds and lived to identify the man who had hurt her. The girl's testimony put away a serial killer wanted for murdering six women. They were heroes and 
They were liars. For decades, the friends have kept a secret worth killing for, but now Olivia wants to tell. And I'm like, there's like a 92% chance Olivia dies. <laughs> Things are not looking good for Olivia. She's trying to tell this deep, dark secret. And Naomi sets out to find out what really happened in the woods, no matter how dangerous the truth turns out to be. 336 pages. I absolutely love the premise. I love Greek mythology, even in the smallest parts. I absolutely love it. So the goddess game, I'm Athena, always. It's sitting at a 4.2 with 478 ratings. So I'm really looking forward to that one. This next one is probably one of the most dark and gruesome books, but also probably one of the ones with the most social commentary for this month. It's a debut novel. It's called Tell Me I'm Worthless by Allison Rumfit. I looked at the cover. Tell Me I'm Worthless, a YA horror? How exciting. I could not have been more wrong. This is a very adult. Content warnings include everything. Graphic assault, homophobia, transphobia, body horror, and mutilation of extreme forms. Obviously those are content warnings that I have gathered from other reviews. I have not read this yet. This is about a haunted house that takes on a life of its own. Three years ago, Alice spent one night in an abandoned house with her friends, Isla and Hannah. Only two walked out and both with their own version of that traumatic night. Since then, Alice's life has spiraled. She lives a haunted existence, selling videos of herself for money, going to parties she hates and drinking herself to sleep. Memories of that night torment Alice. But when Isla asks her to return to the house to go past the keep out sign and over the sick earth where teenagers dare each other to venture, Alice knows she must go. For about three years, these two friends have been keeping their distance from each other. After the trauma from that night, it really severed their relationship. But what makes this return to the house so much more hard to bear for Alice is because Alice is a trans woman and Isla is now a public figure for trans exclusionary radical feminists or TERF which are feminists whose advocacy of women's rights exclude the rights of trans women. Alison Rumfit is a trans woman. She's trying to put us into this experience, the type of hate that people really have and like what it is to be on the other side of that. Alice, who's experiencing really disgusting, disturbing things, which it's like, yeah, it's just disturbing for us, but this really happens. Like that's horror that this happens to people. You're also getting Isla, and their beliefs and where some of that pent up anger and hate really can come from. So I think in this book, the bad guy is gonna be bad, to put it simply. You're gonna get a lot of that. I've always found it really hard to read books where the bad guy, you're getting a lot of their perspective or they're you know, doing bad things, bad people win for a lot. It, it's always made me uncomfortable since I was little. Like with Stephen King books, I'd be like, oh gosh, this is bad. There is a haunted house, but I think the horror in this one is much more, much more disturbing and horrific than a ghost or a jump scare. Life can really give us much more horrific things than that. The next book releases January 19th and it's called The Drift by CJ Tudor. This is an author that is always on my, I need to read more of them, but this is an apocalyptic horror where a dangerous virus is wreaking havoc. Now I know in the anthology, A Sliver of Darkness, I talked about that a month or two ago, maybe in November. Most of those stories were written during the pandemic. So you did get a little bit of that apocalyptic vibe from those. I'm curious curious if this was one that grew into more than a short story, something that could become a novel. This is following three timelines. In the first, we're following Hannah. She awakens to carnage, all mangled metal and shattered glass. During a hasty escape from a secluded boarding school, her coach careened over a hillside road during one of the year's heaviest snowstorms, trapping her inside with a handful of survivors, a brewing virus, and no way to call for help. If she and the remaining few want to make it out alive with their sanity and stay secrets intact. They'll need to work together or they'll be buried alive with the rest of the dead. Then we're following a former detective named Meg who awakens to gentle rocking. She is in a cable car suspended far above a snowstorm and surrounded by strangers in the same uniform as her with no memory of how they got there. They are heading to a mysterious place known only to them as the retreat. But when they discover a dead man among their ranks, she realizes that there is something far more insidious going on. It's like, you're telling me sis because you wake up, you don't know who anyone is. <laughs> 
You're in a cable car? And the final timeline is Carter. He is gazing out the window of an abandoned ski chalet that he and his ragtag compatriots call home. Together, they manage a precarious survival, manufacturing vaccines against a deadly virus in exchange for life's essentials. But as their generator begins to waver, the threat of something lurking in the chalet's depths looms larger, and their fragile bonds we tested when the power finally fails for good. The imminent dangers faced by Hannah, Meg, and Carter are each one part of the puzzle. Lurking in their shadows is an even greater threat, one that threatens to consume all of humanity. <sighs> that sounds awesome. I actually read One by One by Ruth Ware. It was my first book to ever read by her and it was at a ski chalet where everyone was trapped so good. I love, love, I love reading snowy poor or snowy thrillers when it's cold. It just hits different and I just absolutely love one by one. This one seems even more thrilling. I'm going to talk about three more and then I'm just going to rapid fire a couple of books that I just want to mention but I don't want to talk too much about. These next three are coming out January 24th. This is a US debut. The UK version came out September 1st of last year and it's called The Skeleton Key by Erin Kelly. It is the summer of 2021 and Nell has come home at her family's insistence to celebrate an anniversary. Her father, Sir Frank Church is regarded as a cult figure by many. 50 years ago, he wrote The Golden Bones, part picture book, part treasure hunt. It was a fairy story about Eleanor, a murdered woman whose skeleton was scattered all over England. Clues and puzzles in the pages of The Golden Bones led readers to seven sites where jewels were buried. One by one, the tiny golden bones were dug up until only Eleanor's pelvis remained hidden. The book was a sensation. A community of treasure hunters calling themselves the Bone Hunters formed. In frenzied competition, obsessed to a dangerous degree, people sold their homes to travel to England in search for Eleanor. The book made Frank a rich man. It ruined Nell's life. But Sir Frank has reunited the churchers for a very particular reason. The book is being reissued along with a new treasure hunt and a documentary crew are charting the anniversary. Nell's appalled and fearful. During the filming, Frank finally reveals the whereabouts of the missing golden bone and then all hell breaks loose. The golden Bones is reminiscent to me of a book called Masquerade by Kit Williams. This was kind of the UK version of the US version that was called The Secret. So these were books that held clues. I know with The Secret, a lot of the treasure has not been found. I think only three of the items have been found and I think they've narrowed it down to state and even city, but they can't find this treasure. And these, this book came out in I think the 80s. One of them is in Houston. So I might look for the treasure while I'm over there meeting Grady Hendrix. The next one's called Episode 13 by Craig DeLuey. And this has Donica written all over it. I love found footage movies. And I love B movies. Low budget movies are my favorite low budget horror, should I say. I love, I love those types of movies. I would much rather watch a movie like a B film than an Oscar nominated movie. Much to my husband's dismay. <laughs> He's always like, let's watch Life of Pi or like these really great movies. And I'm like, no, like, Let's watch Saw for the 30th time. Fade to Black is the newest hit ghost hunting reality TV show. It's led by husband and wife team Matt and Claire Kirkland and features a dedicated crew of ghost hunting experts. Episode 13 takes them to Matt's holy grail, the Paranormal Research Foundation. This crumbling derelict mansion holds secrets and clues about the bizarre experiments that took place there in the 1970s. It's also undoubtedly haunted and Matt hopes to use their scientific techniques and high-tech gear to prove it. But as the house begins to slowly reveal itself to them, proof of an afterlife might not be everything Matt dreamed of. This is the important part for me. A story told in broken pieces, in tapes, journals, correspondence, and research files. This is the story of episode 13 and how everything went horribly wrong. That's kind of the found footage aspect as you're getting it told in all of these different formats, which y'all know I love that. I live for that. It's 464 pages. That's a little worrisome to me, but my expectations are high. 
and I think I'm gonna love it. The next book is called All Hollows by Christopher Golden. I was like, I know I've heard Christopher Golden. I know I've heard that name before. And I think it's because in January of last year, he released Road of Bones. I saw a lot of buzz about that. I saw a lot of people talking about it and it had mixed reviews. So I've been putting it off, putting it off. I really just wanna finally read him and form my own opinions about his writing. This is such a wonderful January surprise because I feel like this is definitely a Halloween read or a Spooktober read. It says, with the 80s nostalgia of Stranger Things, this horror drama follows neighborhood families and a mysterious lurking evil on one Halloween day. It's Halloween night, 1984. That's pre donica BD before Donica. <laughs> it's Halloween night in Coventry, Massachusetts, and two families are unraveling. Up and down the street, horrifying secrets are being revealed. And all the while, mixed in with the trick-or-treaters of all ages, four children who do not belong are walking door to door, merging with the kids. Children in vintage costumes with faded, eerie makeup. They seem terrified and beg the neighborhood kids to hide them away to keep them safe from the cunning man. There's a small clearing in the woods now that was never there before and a blackthorn tree that doesn't belong at all. These odd children claim that the cunning man is coming for them and they want the local kids to protect them. But with the families falling apart and the neighborhood splintered by bitterness, who will save the children of Parmenter Road? Neighborhood drama? family drama, friend drama, and then a horrific random guy called The Cunning Man. So let me go ahead and round out with the four books I just wanna quickly mention. The first one is The Villa by Rachel Hawkins. I know y'all are seeing this all over. A deliciously wicked gothic suspense set in an Italian villa with a dark history. I read her book, The Wife Upstairs, and I was not blown away by it. I have Reckless Girls by her too. I bought them at the same time. So I wanna read that one in the summer. So just because I was a little disappointed with The Wife Upstairs and also the premise of this one, isn't something that would really entice me too much. That's why I'm just including it at the end. It says it's inspired by Fleetwood Mac, the Manson murders, and the infamous summer Percy and Mary Shelley spent with Lord Byron at a Lake Geneva castle, the birthplace of Frankenstein. That seems like a lot. Like I love all of those individually, but you put them together and it's like, there's a lot going on here. The next one is called Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone by Benjamin Stevenson. This is the US debut of the book coming out in January. It is a murder mystery with a body count and the narrator breaks the fourth wall. That sounds like a really, really fun mystery book. I'm looking forward to that one. The next one's Finley Donovan Jumps the Gun. This is book three in the Finley Donovan series. I've talked about how I really enjoy the series on my channel and I need to read book two already so I can read that one. That is all of the new releases in January I'm looking forward to. Which ones are you looking forward to? Or are there any that I missed? Let me know if you have any questions down below and as always y'all take care and I will see you in my next video.